president for her credential and just let you know that she's now the national president of now National Organization for Women. And uh, it's going to take a good string of ping pong. <laughs> and uh, President Heidi. Thank you, Trudy. I'm told the, uh, there's no public address system, so my first question is, can you hear me? And understand me? Because <laughs> I do want to be heard and I do want to be understood. Oh, so you do want me, okay, well, you're right, all right. Okay, if at any point you cannot hear me and understand me and want to, I assume that you'll do something about it. Uh, stand on your head or, uh, or move someplace else closer or raise your hand or something. I want to thank you for waiting. We have been delayed. I'm not going to tell you that you wouldn't believe the schedule because maybe you would. I think it's been announced that uh, seeing as how we sometimes give titles to these things we call lectures, that my title for tonight would be, She is Risen. For the moment, let's leave it to you to think about what that might mean. I got that from a bumper sticker. It's not original. It's, you know, one of those things, I wish I had thought of that, but I didn't. What I plan to do is talk for about an hour, and in that time we'll hardly have cleared my throat. And then if you want to come in with comments or questions or whatever, why, well, that's your choice. Generally, when I'm on a college campus, I ask if the, uh, or university campus, if the uh, president or her husband is here. I could also ask, but I wouldn't, of course. But now that I've said that, I have to do it, don't I? If there are any men who are here who are married. Some people still do get married, you know, you've heard. Are there men here who are married? That should be, I'm not going to embarrass you, really. Uh, if this weren't, a distinguished university, I would probably ask you something like, what was your name before you were married? But, you know, <laughs> I'm not going to do anything like that. Or, you know, you have children. How do you manage to combine a career in <laughs> homemaking and child care? We don't need to do a detailed study of who clapped on that one, do we? <laughs> and a lot of questions like that. Sometimes I'm asked in one way or another, what's somebody like myself doing involved and very committed to a very activist movement? Somebody who's middle-aged, and that, of course, depends what age you are, what you call middle age, uh, middle class, whatever that is. Middle weight, nobody says that. <laughs> I'm not overweight. As some of you know, I have a liberated body. The question, of course, is not what is anybody who cares about people doing involved in any of the human rights or human liberation movements. The question is, what's anybody doing not involved? Or at the very least, supportive. These are not paid clappers, but I'm <laughs> going to think about it. <laughs> that is, I think, the question. And increasingly, I think, people are asking themselves that. I think an increasing number of women are saying, why am I not involved, or at least supportive? Is it a mark of my oppression that I can continue to ignore the reality that in terms of my legal status, social status, status within a marriage, generally, economically, politically, 
religiously and in every aspect of life, that I'm, I really have a secondary role with some notable exceptions, you know, the loophole women, who with the talent they have would, you know, probably be running the country under other circumstances. And I think that's very healthy to increase the number of women and men are asking themselves precisely that. Women's liberation, women's rights, of course, has benefits for women and for men and for all of our children. There's no question about that. There never was. As you may know, in now, at the National Organization for Women, men are members. And we welcome men. And we are delighted that there are men who are secure and who are mature and who are sensitive enough and bright enough to understand that, of course, there are benefits in this for them, as well as for the women in their lives and their children. At the same time we say that, we also have to make clear that if not a solitary male in the world agreed with, benefited from, approved of this movement, that women are worth it. We could pull it off without the men. It would just be so much easier and so much more beneficial and so much happier if the men join us. So there's no doubt about that. Women's liberation from centuries of oppression will, among other things, put sex in its place and stop limiting the places of women and, in other ways, limiting the options for men. One of the ways we say we can do this is, some of you may have heard me say this before, so you just bear with me as if you never heard it before. And if you didn't, well, you didn't is we take a look at employment applications. You know, they still have, contrary to law, by the way, place on it that says sex, blank. Now, we tell people, you might as well tell them they're going to find out sooner or later anyhow. <laughs> or you could put down after sex, yes. <laughs> No. <laughs> or what did you have in mind? <laughs> this is a very serious audience, I must say. <coughs> or not at the office. That's, I think that's a no-no. Now, we all have our favorite responses to this sort of thing, and I have one, too. My favorite response after that illegal inquiry, sex, is to simply write down, I gave at home. <laughs> now, there's something I've noticed about people here tonight. There's something wrong with you. Really, there's got to be. Now, you know I have to explain that statement, don't I? You see, Everybody knows that feminists have no sense of humor, <coughs> right? You know, we're so serious and uptight about everything. And I'm a feminist. So if you find anything I say has any humor in it, it therefore logically follows, all mythology about women not having any ability to logically think, it therefore follows, it seems to me, that there's something that has to be wrong with you, correct? <laughs> there's something, you know, there's an error in there somewhere. The truth, of course, is that we know the difference between humor and ridicule and insult. And we are not, whatever our conditioning, going to smile sweetly when we've been off offended or insulted, either individually or one of our sisters. And that's an important step for us to take. But we've got a sense of humor. We've survived, haven't we? And you better believe that takes a sense of humor. Now, since I use the word feminist, I should define the term. This is not the only definition. It happens to be my own as a working one. 
I'm sure every feminist, for every feminist, there is a definition. Uh, this is the one I'm working with. A feminist is a person who believes women are people, which sounds simple enough, doesn't it? Not many people would dispute that. We are not considered persons under the basic legal document of the land, the Constitution. You know, when, uh, when that document was written by our forefathers, I keep wondering what our foremothers were doing. <laughs> but when that document was written, our laws were derived, much of our laws have been derived from English common law. And under English common law, women were not considered as persons. No Supreme Court has yet unequivocally declared that women are to be considered as persons under the law. So anybody here who's a female that thinks that you are legally a person, I've got news for you. Until we ratify the Equal Rights Amendment to the Constitution. Remember, I did not say if, I said until. It's only a question I think of when. A feminist, furthermore, I believe, must believe and live that human rights are indivisible by any category. The rights we are talking about must be our birthright, not because of our sex, not because of our race, our religion, our nationality, or anything else except that we are persons, that we are human beings. Furthermore, and at least as importantly as the rest, a feminist is, I think, committed to the equality of the sexes. Equality, do, of course, does not mean sameness. No two individuals are really the same, even identical twins. Equality of the sexes is committed to that, legally, socially, politically, religiously, educationally, in all the rights and responsibilities of life within and outside the home. And you better believe when we achieve that, it will be what I think this feminist movement is, and that is a profound and a universal behavioral revolution. Nothing else and nothing less will do. Now let me give you one more orientation that I could put in other language, but I think it says it more precisely in the language I choose. It may take me all evening to just introduce what I want to talk about. Agree or disagree with this orientation, but philosophically you must understand this and then everything else it seems to me that feminists are advocating and intend to create makes remarkably good sense. And that is there are two jobs or two roles, if you will, that no man is or can be qualified to perform. You know what they are, right? One is human incubator and the other is to be a wet nurse, period. Likewise, there's one job or role that as far as we know, no woman can do or be qualified to do. And that is to be a sperm donor, period. All other roles are learned human roles for people. Believe that only because it's true. With that orientation, we would indeed relate to and raise our children in radically different ways. I think the case could be made, one of the best things we might be do for our children is if we didn't know their sex. Would drive us up the wall and pretend you don't know some time in relation to your own or other's children's sex and see what difference it makes in how you relate to them. What you encourage, what you expect, what you reward. And try to imagine what might be the difference in our own socialization if we were raised in terms of our transcending personhood and not in terms of our presumed adult role related to or dependent on our sex. 
so much for that orientation. Now I'll be talking about sexism. I want to give one definition, not the only one. See, I don't know where you are. I'm not sure what, I don't know you well enough individually or as a group. So I may be repeating things that are, you know, you've heard years ago and have been speaking and writing about yourself. I may not, so you, you just have to bear with me uh, with my ignorance. Jesse Bernard, sociologist, feminist, has said that sexism is the unconscious taken for granted, assumed, unquestioned, unexamined, unchallenged acceptance of the belief that the world as it looks to men is the only world, that the way of dealing with it which men have created is the only way, that the values which men have evolved are the only ones, and that the way sex looks to men is the only way it can look to anyone, and that what men think about what women are like is the only way to think about what women are like. And of course, it isn't only men, and it is not all men. Women have had to accommodate, or thought we've had to accommodate, to this predominant value system. I think the case could be made that the central ethos, the central value system of our society, is what one might call the masculine mystique, and the often accommodating feminine mystique to the near exclusion of the transcending human mystique and the real potential of humans. Now I want to share something else with you. And it's called woman, which includes man, of course. It's an experience and awareness. It was done by Theodore Wells, who's a member of NOW in California. Let me check before I do it. If you've all heard this, you've shared it before, I'm not going to repeat it. Have you? I hear couple of chuckles here of, of what I presume be recognition. Okay. I'm glad because I really wanted to do it. <laughs> There's much concern today about the future of man, which of means, of course, both men and women, the generic man. For a woman to take exception to this use of the term man is often seen as defensive hair splitting by an, quote, emotional female. So this experience is an invitation to awareness in which you are asked to feel into and stay with your feelings through each step, letting them absorb you. If you start intellectualizing, go back to the step where you can again sense your feelings, then proceed. You may want to keep count of how many times you need to go back, if at all. Consider reversing the generic term man. Think of the future of woman which of course includes both women and men. Feel into that and sense its meaning to you as a woman, as a man. Think of it always being that way every day of your life. Feel the ever presence of woman and the non-presence of man. Absorb what it tells you about the importance and the value of being woman, of being man. Recall that everything you have ever read all your life uses only female pronouns. She, and you know that includes he, her, meaning both girls and boys, both women and men. Recall that most of the voices on radio and most of the faces on TV are women's when important events are covered, on commercials, on late talk shows. Recall that you have no senator representing you in Washington. Feel into the fact that women are the leaders, the power centers, the prime movers. Man whose natural role is husband and father fulfills himself through nurturing children and making the home a refuge for woman. This is only natural to balance the biological role of woman who devotes her entire body to the race during pregnancy. Pregnancy is the most revered power known to woman, and man, of course. Then feel further into the obvious biological explanation for woman as the ideal, her genital construction. By design, female genitals are compact and internal, protected by her body. Male genitals are so exposed that he must be protected from outside attack 
to assure the perpetuation of the race. His vulnerability obviously requires sheltering. <laughs> Thus, by nature, males are more passive than females and have a desire in sexual relations to be symbolically engulfed by the protective body of the woman. Males psychologically yearn for this protection, fully realizing their masculinity at this time and feeling exposed and vulnerable at other times. A man experiences himself as a, quote, whole man, unquote, when thus engulfed. If the male denies these feelings, he is unconsciously rejecting his masculinity. <laughs> Therapy is thus indicated to help him and adjust him to his own nature. Of course, the therapy is administered by a woman <laughs> who has the education and the wisdom to facilitate openness leading to the male's growth and self-actualization. To help him feel into his defensive emotionality, he is invited to get in touch with the child in him. He remembers his sister's jeering at his primitive genitals that, quote, flop around foolishly, unquote. <laughs> she can run, climb, and ride horseback unencumbered. Obviously, since she is free to move, she is encouraged to develop her body and mind in preparation for her active responsibilities of adult womanhood. The male vulnerability needs female protection, so he is taught the less active, caring virtues of homemaking. Because of his vagina envy, <laughs> he learns to bind up his genitals, and he learns to feel ashamed and unclean because of his nocturnal emissions. <laughs> Instead, he is encouraged to dream of getting married, waiting for the time of his fulfillment when his woman gives him a girl child to care for. He knows if it is a boy child, he has failed somehow, but they can try again. <laughs> in getting to the child in him, these early experiences are reawakened. He is at an encounter group entitled On Being a Man, which is led by a woman. In a circle of 19 men and four women, he begins to work through some of his deep feelings, and so forth, and so on. And this is one of hundreds of experiences in awareness that I might have shared with you. And I hope you will make available to yourself if you haven't already. Very often people tell us that we make too much of the language, the generic man. In what I refer to as one of my other lives, I've worked as a uh, behavioral research scientist. And one of the things I did was uh, uh, concept papers, research development, so forth, and reports. And as colleagues do, we share these draft papers with each other. So I very often would simply, you know, put in woman for man, she for uh, uh, personal pronouns, sex unspecified, and so forth and so on. And uh, my colleagues would come to me with something like, and, and I can tell you that this, uh, this bothered the, uh, the men only a little more than the women. And I know part of it was simply a change in habit. But now these were presumably mature, secure behavioral scientists, presumably having more than the usual insights and the opportunities to gain them about the nature of human behavior and so forth. But I want to tell you it absolutely drove them up the wall and they would come to me with an absolutely straight face and in all seriousness would say, as a revelation, as a revelation, Wilma, do you realize that you left out half the population? <laughs> and I would say with as straight a face as I could imagine, oh, you noticed. <laughs> now anybody who doubts the importance of women's exclusion from the language on the consciousness of every child, girl and boy, and of every adult, 
You try reversing it. One day, one hour, one week, one month. And you will have an interesting experience with people telling you how trivial it is, often with great anger. <laughs> That's when you know sometimes that you've struck a nerve. We have, of course, now I just want to talk about different issues. Now, if anybody's here tonight from a speech class who's supposed to grade, you know, sometimes speech class people are sent out to where there's a public speech being given. So if you have anything like that, anybody here, and there's a section that says organization, just put down lousy, and then you can stop worrying about that and think about what we're talking about. Because what I have here is some notes. I want to talk about uh, some issues and some of the things we've been doing in no particular order. I made reference to the fact the only kinds of jobs that I think had either maleness, you can't hear, okay. I didn't, haven't said anything for the last minute, you didn't miss anything. I was just really thinking about what I was going to say out loud, okay. I made reference earlier to the fact that there were uh, uh, only a few kinds of roles that would exclude all women, only one really, or that would exclude all men. These were learned. Now that includes childcare, which in my view is probably the gut level issue of the feminist movement and of society generally. Not only childcare in terms of our bringing this really backward, socially backward country into the 20th century on our concepts of child care and is the need for child development care in addition to, not as a replacement for, not as a substitute for, but in addition to that that is given in the home. It is necessary for children to broaden their horizons. It is necessary for adults often to broaden their horizons. You know, it's interesting that in limiting half the population essentially to the home, limited options beyond that and in limited ways, and therefore a limiting the self-concept, the horizons, and the world of that half the population, that's precisely the half that we've asked to take care of our children. So in a kind of circular fashion, our children, I think, have been intimately influenced by the fact that they have been cared for primarily by people whose own self-concept and experience has been limited. Now, that's not the only reason why women have to have more options. We have to have it because we're important as people. But there have been derivative effects, effects on the limitation of women. Child care, I think, is a gut level issue because we often find people who agree with everything else will say that's fine until we get to the home. For some women, what we're saying when we talk about the need for a different concept and for uh, child development kinds of centers, for some women this is a threat because this is a thing that some women have been presumably the experts at. And there's no question that some have done an excellent job. And if you threaten the one thing that I can do, I'm going to defend the need for my and others apparently like me being the only ones appropriate to do it. I think that's very understandable. If I have no options to that, and if I gain my identity through that, I don't want that taken away from me. You're robbing me of some of myself. So we need to understand that. We also find that for some, not all men, it's such a gut level issue because there, there are men who can intellectualize, you know, and discuss all this movement and get all the jargon and so forth, fine, but don't bring it home to their doorstep, to the whole politics of, uh, of child care in terms of who does it. And I'm not talking about men helping out. You know, if I had a nickel for every man that say, oh, I think men should do child care, I change diapers on my kids and I help my wife. And they probably did do more than many other men did. But that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about as a shared role, as in some experiences, as mutually agreed on, 
as men being the primary child rears. I really don't think maleness is a bona fide occupational disqualification for child care. I do think we have deprived men's expression of their nurturant and their tender and their caring potential, just as we have deprived our children of knowing more in more ways and in more situation and in more intimate day-to-day -day detail of the potential for men to also to be caring and tender and nurturant. Not to mention the potential this has to make nurturance a public value. And until we have that kind of public value, we can expect precisely the kinds of public policies that we're seeing today. Child care programs being cut off. It's going, it's going to force some people, already has, to accept the public assistance, which is their right. It's going to do the opposite of what its presumed objectives are. It's very insensitive of the needs of people, including our children. Child care in terms of the kinds of child care that is given, certainly non-sexist, non-racist, that values the individuality. The moment we relate to an infant, to a child, to an individual, any assumption Among other things, we are saying that men need the potentially humanizing experience of child care. Not necessarily humanizing. People forced into that role against their will express their resentment of it in one way or another. Let me share with you just one thing. In Pittsburgh, I used to live in Pittsburgh and near Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. When we first began reporting the battered child, that is, as a phenomenon for what it was, the first 500 cases of that at the Children's Hospital in Pittsburgh were children of parents, the mother of which was at home full time. Now that is not to say it's a cause and effect phenomenon, but that's too high a positive correlation to be ignored. Let me talk about another political area, and all these are really political in the generic sense. Those of us who were active in forming and in working with the National Women's Political Caucus and its counterparts in states and communities all over this country have been aware for some time that politics has been a white male club. And that is a far cry from a democracy. I think the development of the Women's Political Caucus to the extent that it has and maintains and insists on a feminist perspective and commitment will turn out to be the most significant political development in this country's history. That feminist perspective, and I know there are people in the caucus, as someone who's been active in it, who do not like to think of themselves as feminists, do not think it is necessary. But I say to you in all, all candor, the only thing that made that exciting and will make it exciting and anything different than the role women have always played in politics is the feminist perspective and is the feminist commitment. So we need to do a lot more consciousness raising in the Women's Political Caucus, but it's a very significant beginning. We saw some of the results if we were either at or watched the conventions this past year. Some of the numerical results, some of the difference in the stated platforms of the parties. But the most significant thing, as is what 
it's the most uh, significant thing that's happening in this movement is what's going on in people's heads. The changed self-confidence. There are people I could cite to you and I suspect that you could cite to me who simply are not the same people they were a year ago or two years ago. I know a woman who was president, for instance, of a New York chapter of now. Now, there's no chapter larger, livelier, more controversial, more, more challenging, who told me that two years before that, she had to be encouraged to, to get the courage to stand up and second a motion at a now meeting among her friends. I'm reminded also of a woman in Pennsylvania who came to a Pittsburgh now meeting Oh, 1968, and she said, I don't have any talent. I don't know what I can do to help. I'll lick your envelopes, anything you say, but I'm so damn glad you're here. And I want to tell you, she didn't know anything about legislature then, or she said she didn't. But within about a year and a half, she, I'm sure, more than any other person, was responsible for the excellent women's rights legislation we got through in Pennsylvania in terms of serving as a catalyst, being knowledgeable, and so forth and so on. She still would not get out in front of a group and speak. And at the signing of one of these bills, I was president because I was on a state commission. So I got received a pen. I thought she should have it. She didn't want to take it. She really didn't think she was worthy of it. And let me tell you what finally persuaded her to accept that pen. When I realized she wasn't going to take it on the merit alone, I said to her, oh, you know, you really weren't all that great. You're probably right. You weren't all that terrific. It's just that I want to make sure you have something to write with as you keep those letters going to the legislator. And on that ground, with that kind of approach, when she saw that all of us really wanted her to have it, you know, for whatever it was worth. She finally said yes. I could cite to you just hundreds of examples of people who are rethinking who we are and who we might be. And that is some of the most important things that are going on. We are asking different questions. We are asking, truthfully, if men are smart enough and humane enough to manage a home and take care of children. And of course they are, some more than others, or are educable, I think. <laughs> we are also asking, can we continue to accept that rape of our land is considered more serious than rape of our women? Rape is the absolutely predictable outcome of any sexist society, absolutely predictable inevitable, we can be sure of it. We're all fair game, we're all fair game. The problem is not the rapist per se, we know that. You know that's, rape has increased 33% since 1968 in the so-called law and order society and that's a law and order issue too, you better believe. We are aware that on the question of population, it's quality as well as quantity. The issue is not population control. About two years ago, I, as an afterthought, a prompted afterthought, I might say, was asked to testify for the U.S. Commission on Population Growth in the American Future. And they were a very normal commission, that is, it was mostly men. <laughs> 24 commissioners, four were women, one was a feminist, almost. The other three weren't. They thought, the guys, some of the guys on the commission, I'm told, thought I was pretty terrible because I was angry. And I did ask them to reconstitute themselves to at least represent the population. I thought at least on the population commission they might be demographically <laughs> representative. I didn't think that was too much <laughs> optimism at all. It, 
it, it constantly amazes me that people who spent their lifetime working on the whole question of population, you see, they were, they were at the point when I testified, they were talking about policies for population control. And I tried to make the point that the issue was not control. That was inherently anti-human. We were not at the point time in our society where we needed to control. And they should not delude themselves into thinking that this country doesn't have population policy. You don't have to spell it out in a book or sheet of paper that you have a policy if your practices are such that, in effect, that represents a policy. Our tax policies are pro-natalist. <coughs> this country has, has a policy on population, has had for some time. The issue, it seemed to me, was to see that, there, that they, we arrive at a position that we talk about choices about population, not population control. But I'm constantly amazed people who spent virtually a lifetime, if not a lifetime, working in this area that haven't yet gotten the message that unless women from the second of birth have viable, operative alternatives to motherhood as their chief and perhaps only adult occupation, women will continue to overproduce children to the exclusion or near exclusion of producing the art, the literature, the invention, the leadership, and all the kinds of things that we know full well that we have the talent or the potential to produce. That seems to be fairly obvious, that we need to have and I think we'll have, and we've already seen some results of this, I th and I think it is at least partly from the feminist movement, we're beginning to see women who are becoming procreationally unemployed or underemployed. <laughs> one does not have to become a parent to prove that one is really a genuine bona fide male or a genuine bona fide female. We all have some talents we don't use all the time. And I don't suppose it'd be any news to anybody here that there are people who are not suited for parenthood. And you know, femaleness is not a bona fide occupational qualification for parenthood. It really isn't. The kindest thing I'm sure some of us could do is to opt not to have children, not to mention all the children who do need, who do need some caring people around. And independent of all that, I think one could make the case that maybe adults are the worst people in the world to raise children. And particularly sometimes children's own parents. Children, other children, often do much better. If you ever notice children together, how they can always, often understand each other and others can't. It's a different, the world for our children is just not the same as it is. It is not the same for me as it is for my children. At least I think I know it. I'm not sure that I know always what to do about it. But at least I think I'm aware that it's a different world. And it will be increasingly so, I think, for each generation as the rate of cultural acceleration speeds up. Now let me talk about the area of... Uh, what shall I call it, business, economics, and so forth. Now has been active in this area. <laughs> That's probably the gross understatement of the year, compliance. As you may or may not know, we, uh, we know we had some part in the, uh, the beginning of the change of behavior of what is generally called Ma Bell, but it's really Pa Bell. That's AT&T, the largest civilian employer in the country. And you may know uh, Dr. Sally Hacker from uh, Des Moines, who's been our national coordinator of the AT&T Task Force and who's hiding somewhere in this room tonight. Uh, and she may at some time tell you more about it. But I think very early in, uh, in Now's history, or her story, if you will, just to see if you're awake, we realized that AT&T being the largest civilian employer, that they did need some attention. We were after the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, almost from our inception, to get after 
telephone company, and finally they did. They developed a task force, a legal task force. And let me share with you something that happened to the to the uh, to the young man who uh, headed up this task force. He's an attorney, more sensitive than many people, more knowledgeable, very able young man. But some of the women there at the Conforming Opportunity Commission decided he needed a little more consciousness raising. One of the things I'm told that they did was for about a week, when they went out to lunch or anywhere, they got to lunch. They held his chair, his coat, lit his cigarettes. They went any place, they carried a briefcase or anything, they carried it. They did all the things that men have so kindly done for women. I will not for a moment question, unless I know enough to question, the motivation of men doing it. Men have been taught to do this. I think this is a form of human courtesy. I have absolutely no problem with human courtesies. I have no problem with holding a man's coat or holding the door for a man or pulling out the chair or lighting his cigarette or buying his lunch if I can afford it. Men generally can't afford it better than women, and so forth and so on. But at any rate, they did this apparently for about a week. <coughs> at the end of two days, he said, I get your point. <laughs> Enough. At the end of four days, he said, please, I really don't think you need to do any more. I know what you mean. You feel very unable to do things. You feel very dependent, you know? And you begin to feel sort of incapable. And I know that this is put on top of all the other ways that you're made to feel not able to do things and made to feel dependent please, but they didn't think it was quite enough, two more days. By the end of that time, I'm told, he was on his knees and he said, I really do understand. You know. So you, sometimes we need to do things like that. Well, that task force was really a very swinging task force. They did quite a job, and among other things, they came out with a report on the AT&T that was called A Unique Competence. And the title of the report was drawn from the, a quote from the uh, chairman of the board, one time of AT&T uh, who had said that AT&T, because it is very much scattered around the country, because the entry-level nature of many of the jobs, because they did have a variety of jobs, and so forth and so on, had a unique competence to be a fair employer. What the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission found in its 2,700-page report and 300-page summary thereof was that AT&T had a unique competence to be without doubt, and I quote, the largest oppressor of women in the country. I think we knew what we were doing when we got to AT&T. Well, in October of this year, some of us, including again Sally Hacker from here in Iowa, met with the president of AT&T and the vice president. We asked, what about the issue of the back pay due to the women there, you know, getting unequal pay for equal work and the unequal being less, in case there's any doubt. <laughs> uh, uh, Robert Lilly, the president, said he had an emotional hang-up about that and so forth and so on, but we wanted to establish something. And so then on January 5th, what we did was present a bill to AT&T for four billion dollars on behalf of the women at the uh, uh, Bell Telephone, based on the documentation of the EEOC report at the rate of 500 million dollars per year. Well, finally there was, after, uh, after the General Service Administration accepted a so-called affirmative action pro uh, plan from a uh, telephone company that in our view was not adequate and we challenged and were able to persuade the Office of Federal Contract Compliance to take jurisdiction. But finally, on January 8, 18th, without going to court, there was a settlement made. It, it was the total for uh, women of all races and minority men was uh, $38 million. When asked about it, now's response was that this was chicken feed. And in relation to the $4 billion owed, $38 million ain't very much. We figure they still owe $3 billion uh, $962 million in order for them to be simply law-abiding citizens, let alone all the non-economic damage they did, psychologically and otherwise, whatever their motivation. However, it is also true that this was a landmark settlement. 
in terms of the amount and in terms of the conditions that will be required of the Bell Telephone Company. So now they, like uh, other employers who are beginning to get the message, nothing like is needed and nothing like we intend, are beginning to brag about some of the things that I can assure you they were forced to do. <laughs> Anytime that people say you cannot legislate morality, <laughs> there are many instances where we can point to the fact that we've been doing it for centuries. When we have the laws and when we have the compliance with the laws. Now let me tell you about some of the advertising aspects of business. And again, this is one of thousands of examples, examples I might give. We still have a lot of education to do, if you haven't noticed, advertising. Eastman Kodak recently, having produced a apparently small, neat little camera, was prepared to do promotional work on this directed to women. And what they were planning to do was state that it was small and it was efficient. It was so neat that women could drop it down their breasts and it be considered their bosom buddy. Oh. <laughs> well, there's a rumor that now members are all over the place. And I ain't gonna stop that rumor, but I'm glad that there was a now member in Rochester, New York, who picked that up, who challenged the company. Now, it happened to have been men who made up this promotional. It could have been women. Women have participated in this and other ways in our own offensive behavior. So anyhow, the guys ask her what was the objection, and apparently this took place by telephone. And she said to the man that she talked with on the phone, she said, well, sir, let's put it like this. Let's take the same camera and develop a promotional campaign directed to the men. <laughs> the same size camera and we'll suggest you can put it down in your shorts and you can call it your penis pal. <laughs> now then and only then, and I think unfortunately in many ways that's the only way some people are going to get the message in their <laughs> own terms. I've said already when we look at the whole phenomenon of the Miss America contest, and that's true whether it's Miss America or Miss Iowa or whatever it is, what if we had a counterpart Mr. America? If it's a healthy thing and if it's desirable, Let's follow the model that we've been taught. Why not? That means we, of course, will have the swimsuit competition, knowing, of course, that men's real beauty is inner. <laughs> we will, of course, publish the measurements of whatever their parts, <laughs> right? That would, of course, be obscene. I think if there's, any, if there's any value, and I think it's a very big if, to any contest like this, let's have a Ms, and that is MS, America contest, and advance whole women, not just our breasts. Women who are strong, caring, competent, and courageous as models like our daughters have never had before. Let's begin to do some of that. I have a friend who's a member of now, a Reverend Patricia Bud Kepler, and I hope you get to know her work. She's going to go to Harvard University soon. It must be one of the smartest things Harvard's ever done. She's going to be head up their uh, program for the ministry, ministerial students. And you know I wouldn't bring this in if she weren't a feminist. She's done a brilliant, she has done a brilliant lecture on women and the en end of the age of innocence. And I wish I could share all this with all of you. She reminds us that we still, particularly as women, may be more concerned about the obscenity 
have a few words in a periodical, a few words in a movie, and not concerned about the obscenity of poverty in a land that can well afford to feed all. She word, wor warns us about the obscenity of women still spending their time trying to get washes whiter than white. You know, you know that uh, cleanliness has surpassed godliness in our value system, don't you? <laughs> we used to think it was next to godliness, but I think it's overtaken it. You know, women encouraged to have washes whiter than white, generally by men who don't get involved in the laundry, and not spending time worrying about the pollution of our streams. Or that women, still being taught, may be more concerned How about men who are just plain drunk rather than the many men who are really drunk with power? And maybe both of them drunk from the stresses and the pressures of the masculine mystique and s suggest, as we are indeed not only suggesting but advocating, trying to make happen, that we give our concerns as people, as women, that we move out to the public realm and share the genuine concerns we have about the quality of life. That has got to make a difference. Just using all the human intelligence we have instead of less than half of it. It is absolutely statistically stupid. Just on the face of it, not to use the intelligence in our public sphere. I wonder if here at Iowa State University you have taken, done an examination of the budget of the university as a study of the values of the university. Do you have enough money for child care? You do know that at this point in time, with women expected to be the primary child rears, that the absence of child care is going to guarantee that women have employment, limited employment opportunities, is going to guarantee that women have limited opportunities to pursue their educational careers. As a part of the affirmative action that this university must have because of the public funds that it receives, child care must be available. I would hope that nobody here persuades anybody who's aware of that and cares that you cannot afford it here at the university. If you can afford the stadiums I see here and the other things that you well know that are made available and often either exclusively or mostly for men, this university can afford to have child care. You are not true to yourselves if you do not insist on it for yourselves and your sisters, and I say that to you as women and as men. This university or no other can begin to live up to its educational potential, to its stated educational goals, if it has not already or does not engage in massive consciousness raising about the profound effects of sexism on us all, and that does include this university. To the extent that any university, any high school, any grade school, any institution is sexist, and I do mean sex role stereotyping and accepts the appropriateness of assuming that men will be in the positions of leadership. And I would say this if, they, if there was any orientation that accepted that women are naturally the leaders, either one. But to the extent that that still exists, this university is misusing public funds. We have had for centuries affirmative action programs for white men. We just haven't called it that. Affirmative action programs are not new. So when we talk about universities, about organizations, 
about employers of any kind, whatever, obeying civil rights laws and executive orders, we are talking about law and order and justice. We are aware in relation to the poverty in this affluent land that among those children who suffer from hunger, and children do in this society, and malnutrition, twice as many girls are victims as boys. Think about that. Have you ever lived in a family where there was a limited amount of protein? I have. And everybody knows that boys need more energy, are going to be more active, going to be on sports teams and so forth. And not so coincidentally, there are reasons why more girls would prefer to be boys than boys would prefer to be girls, because there is a perceived advantage in it. And it has an effect, I think, right here. We know that there is a literacy in this land, functional or absolute illiteracy, which is also unconscion unconscionable in a country where knowledge of the written word and its use is virtually a survival requirement. 80% of the illiterates in this society are women and girls. And then we think about that and we realize very quickly that there's still the notion that really women don't need all that education, do they? Because, you know, we're just going to get married and have children. And that's how much we really think about our children. And that's how much we really think about women. I think the question we all have to ask ourselves, whoever we are, whatever our background, among other things, is, if the white patriarchal model of either family or nation state is either desirable or viable. And there's evidence in this society, even though the evidence may be given other names, that it is not and it perhaps never was. We are aware there's a lot of air pollution in this society that isn't called that. And I refer to the air pollution we find in the broadcast media. You know, I'm tired as I listen to little girls, and I do, my own daughters included when they were younger, say things like, they'd like to be an announcer, they guess they're going to have to become a boy. and asking why women can't be in the Congress because there are so few, I think it's now 14, they think you have to be a man to be in Congress. And I don't have a good answer for the little girls who ask, why do they always talk about salesman and male man? <laughs> 